Oh, um, and with that, stream starts. I won't start talking until somebody in chat starts talking. That's my new policy. Not original. I took it from Universal Discourse. I think it's pretty good. I'm in no rush to start things. I can wait for people. And just one person. Right now, it's just me and you. How you doing? You have the time of Senpai all to yourself. How's it been? I've been busy. I made an update to my Patreon. Ooh, an idea. If you were to stream and play music, you probably... You would not get DMCA. That you bought, doesn't matter. From a game? S some games are shady. Some games will actually fight you, and other games will allow it. Like MapleStory. MapleStory music, that's allowed on stream. It's copyright free. But... There's even been cases with Nintendo as a whole company will DMCA copyright strike the music of video games that you stream even though you have bought the game so yeah it's it's weird for video game music it's a big depends Quite simply, you can use any music you own. Mm, where are you getting that quote from? So I know for, I think, Cyberpunk 2077, they tweeted out or... They said something. It was some statement, okay? Trust me on this. It was some statement saying, oh, there is an option where you can toggle streamer-friendly or whatnot so that... You don't get copyright striked when you stream the game. Yeah, they've been doing that. They did that. That's really good. I hope they do it. But I wouldn't trust it. I wouldn't trust it for... All the other games. Google? Google? If you send me it, I could look at it too. Sources how to geek. Interesting. I'm not sure if I would trust that. Good, good, good. Okay. We'll take a look at this really quickly for your sake. Hey everyone, what's up? Trickling in. We're gonna get started really soon, but we're just chilling. Fucking around. How to find Twitch approved music for streaming. There's a bunch of ways, so you could find it yourself 
if you know music that is not copyrighted that is free of use you can make your own playlist and use an application that's really handy every streamer ought to know nightbot what nightbot does is you can combine a bunch of music from it has to be from one source so either youtube soundcloud etc etc and it makes a playlist it's a player it's a media player no ads so that's how i usually listen to music i don't go on youtube i use nightbot it does take a bit more cpu i believe but it's really handy and twitch has partnered with audible magic to scan safe streams and clips for copyrighted content yeah this is what's fucking up everybody because even if you don't have an a vod on Twitch, it's already saved in their databases and they're going to scan it. And even if you didn't have it on your VODs, in your VOD library, you could still get DMCA'd. So this is not something good. <laughs> this first sentence is shit. Hey, Lollymater, yo, what's up? In the past, blah, 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 there's a DMCA, what this means for Twitch streamers. You're in a rule that when using music on your streams, if you play any music for which you don't have the proper licensing, you get penalized. This is true. You could get the MCA. Though, if you're a smaller streamer, that wouldn't really affect you. So, it only affects larger streamers. Because that's where they're going to be getting the most money from. So, I've used copyright music for a, a while now. I've just recently made the switch to this lo-fi playlist that I got from from Harris he goes by Alpha Gaming on YouTube I watch a lot of his content it's pretty helpful streamers are given three strikes and these three strikes so long as you do it three times you're fucked so if you have 10 VODs of dmc-able content of dmc will music that's well 10 out of three you're done for all right music that you're allowed to use quite simply you can use it's not simple at all because how do you know if you own the music if you own the game unless the game company explicitly tells you that you're allowed to do it or if the not even the the creators of the music has this power you have to go through record labels like actual proper licensing amazon music provides dmca okay see so boom you can use amazon music does that a spotify account doesn't mean you have a license yes yeah it's pretty fucked it's not even an F word, respect. This is a big L. Uh, okay. Man, if you're really into lo-fi, if you're really into lo-fi, I would send you the playlist that I use. Just put that onto Nightbot, and that's your stream music. Monster Cat, yes. Monster Cat has allowed people to stream music without fear of copyright copyright strikes or ooh, soda burp ooh another one or DMCA strikes okay they're the same thing I don't know why I said it twice the problem with monster cat music is if you were to upload things onto YouTube that's when you can get demonetized you're not gonna get striked but you're gonna get demonetized So, I used to stream music from Monster Cat, but I don't anymore. My bitrate is falling. Today, today is not good. Today is not good. I bought the DLC that gave me out OST Satch now. So, you have the ability to listen to it yourself. 
but what's the problem is you disseminating out to other people slash your audience it's spreading that's what's illegal in theory the game companies could also dmca strike you yes yes they can Mm. People, let me know if stream is lagging. I'm gonna just move around. Does it feel jaggy? The music for the game is lo fi. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, Selfish, what's up? Yeah, we got a decent group of people here already, so I think I could get started. We're only 13 minutes left in. Yeah, what's up? What's up? I'm talking about music, DMCA, copyright, what's approved for streaming, what's not approved, how to be careful. I know when I play MapleStory, Nexon isn't going to do that. They've explicitly said that none of it is copyrighted and that we're allowed to spread it around. I don't know about Genshin Impact. Maybe that's something I should look up because I've been playing quite a decent amount of Genshin Impact on stream. But then again, when I do upload my VODs onto YouTube, it doesn't get copyright striked. So I'm willing to bet that Genshin Impact Muhoyo doesn't copyright strike music. It is okay now. According to dashboard.twitch.tv, it is not okay. Is that stream delayed? Because I asked that a while ago. Uh, today's probably not a good day. Oh. Yeah, there's... There's stream delay. What's up? Did you get a new computer? I did not. No, no, no. <laughs> I got two boxes. I have no idea if I'm pretty sure one of them. Okay, one of them is definitely part to my computer. The other is a mystery because I bought either computer parts from Amazon or I didn't buy it from Amazon. I used Amazon to buy things. It's in an Amazon box. It's either a painting computer parts or both so let's actually get started there will be a cyberpunk streamer option yeah that's that's something that i talked about earlier it's really good that they're doing that Okay, box number one. We got two boxes. To be honest, I was thinking that I was going to get three. from One from Costco. It said that it was supposed to come in yesterday. It didn't come in yesterday. So, I got actually a bit scared thinking that somebody robbed me. Somebody might have robbed me. I hope not. I hope somebody didn't rob me. Okay, bags. I could use these later if I want to ship anything. Uh, a lot of airbags. I throw these on the floor. And what do we have here? I see... I think two boxes? Okay, first of all, Trident Z RGB. What is this? What did I buy? I think this was RAM. Yeah, I think this is RAM. So I got the memory six. Woohoo. Put that back into the box. Oh, this is this is actually kind of heavy. All right. Uh. NZXT, this is the Kraken X63 
280 millimeter liquid cooler with RGB. Red, not red, this is red, green, blue. Oh my God, red, gray, blue has got me mixed up with red, green, blue. What a dude. This, these are the fans. I forget how much these cost. I just bought them. That's it for this box. I'll put this onto the side. That's two out of nine parts. Let me catch up on Twitch chat. Uh, there goes frame rate. Fuck! A painting of computer parts is my guess. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's Pikachu. Pikachu is going to get a friend. The brick wall needs to be covered. Pikachu is going to be getting a friend. Looks like an AIOU RAM. I, it's not RAM. <laughs> God. Oh, that would have been beautiful. You have a 240 millimeter? Did I say I had 280 or 240? I already forget what I got. All right, second box. Second box. This is the Amazon box. It's the mystery box. It's either computer parts or a painting. I'm not sure. It doesn't tell me. It does say on the box, lithium ion batteries in compliance. So, I suspect it is technology related? Let's find out. Remember when using the knife cut away from you? Do not cut towards you, that's really bad. Do not cut yourself. Always close your knife. Airbags and woohoo! This is what we have. Asus in search of incredible. Throw it out though. Up there. Perf Gaming. This is the motherboard. X570 slash pro Wi Fi. Let's go. A bunch of things, a bunch of logos on the bottom. Is this an AMD motherboard? No, it's not. Asus one, but it says a CPU, AMD, AM4 socket for third and second generation, AMD, Ryzen. All right, I have no idea what these mean. Okay, back in the box you go. Do I want to send it your way? No, I don't want to send it your way. These are mine. I said 280? Okay. This is why I have Twitch shed so that you guys can remember what I say. <laughs> Blow up one of them? Hell no. So that's three out of nine parts, and I've bought seven. So, blah, 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 doing the math correctly, four more are on their way. The two parts that I'm missing are obviously the cpu and the gpu the two most important parts the two most expensive parts that i have yet to get because they're out of stock fucking bots fucking scalpers amd and nvidia did not make enough to match demand and i am sad motherboard manufacturer is different from cpu yeah it's weird I was just reading stuff from the box. Hey, yo, what's up, Chinchilla? I just finished my unboxing stream, so I need to change. All right, that was a bit weird. I was expecting my 144 hertz screen to be coming in well supposed to be tomorrow yesterday thought it was going to be come today if not yesterday so maybe tomorrow uh, who knows 
if I get any more boxes, I'll do more unboxing streams on the next stream. If not, then it's just going to be a regular stream. Yeah, man, fuck scalpers. Making my life difficult. But I could wait. I, fuck, man. I keep on saying I could wait. Honestly. But every single time I have an issue with video editing. Every single time I have an issue with stream when it comes to bit rate and quality and things. All, all computer related problems I want I want to get that computer more and more and more sunglasses cat yo what's up I was once searching an online shop for a Ryzen CPU and there was only like two it turned out the rest were in the cooler category because they included the default ventilators video editing I do YouTube yeah I just started doing YouTube seriously like a month ago I always had YouTube channels but I seriously got into it last month. It was a difficult thing to get around to. Because YouTube is hard. I find streaming a lot easier. Then again, I've been streaming a lot longer than doing YouTube. And if I were to pick one, being a professional streamer or a professional YouTuber, I would be a professional streamer 100% down. Nice, do you do post like a vid already on YouTube? Yeah. I've had a gaming channel for a while. That's how I really wanted to start out streaming was by gaming. Frame rate dropped again. Oh no, fuck it. <laughs> Maybe this will just be my stream. We won't do anything else or I could... I could stop stream. And it would suck because... Hey everybody, what's up? I actually have a decent amount of viewers. <laughs> it's gonna get fucked! So catch me later. Stream is not always like this. Give me a follow. If you want to check out my YouTube, well, use the chat commands. Hashtag YouTube. I have three channels. I have a main channel, a gaming channel, and a bots channel. All nice. It's weird. Really weird how I ended up with three YouTube channels. Because at first I had one. Then I wanted to start getting into politics. Then I made two. And then I realized, wow, making two sucks. So then I started, I think, I thought about just going by one. And then eventually I ended up with three. How did that happen? It's fine now. Dude, man. Those things bug me. I want that computer now. But I have to wait. I have to wait. Gotta persevere. Gotta give it a few more weeks. A few more weeks and... I don't have to buy from scalpers. I don't have to pay $1,000 a piece. That would suck if I had to pay $1,000 a piece. It'll make it go from a 2k PC to a 3k PC. The 50% increase. Actually, was it today? One of the videos went live today. And I totally forgot to do this. I have so much on the plate. I have to do I have to think about a lot now. Gotta go into stream labs and change one of the commands. That's my latest YouTube channel. My, not on my latest YouTube channel. Blech. My latest YouTube video is the first part of my interview with Round Midnight Underscore. Go to Hot Tools Cloudbot. Quotes, timers, name, modules, commands, custom commands, video, latest YouTube video. Gotta change that. I think I just find the link on my Discord. Yeah, I can. Hell yeah. Oh, unfortunately. Oh, shit. What happened to my chat? Just disappeared. 
Oh, it's because I went on to Streamlabs. That's weird. That should be edited now. Guys, make me happy and use my bot commands. I put them there for a reason. It's good information. I don't want the bot to spam chat with it. So I figure it out. If people want to know, people want to know, I'll give, I'll put the commands, I'll put it on scroll and people would see. But then people don't use it and then it gets sad. No, 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 no. Just look at stream. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Uh Hey, first thing some classes wants is my my anime list. Dike socked I'm just going to spam everything. So something that I figured out with the Streamlab spot is it lags. You can't spam all the commands at once. So a lot of the times when I see other streamers trying to shout out other people and they do it one after the other, the second time, because it's so fast, the bot doesn't even get it. Rise tweets and I totally forgot about fleets. I said I was going to start using fleets and then I didn't. YouTube doesn't work at all. No, you just got to wait. There, There is no commands. Why is there a command command for commands? I would have so many commands. You know what I don't like? Personally, I don't like it when there's a command that gives a paragraph. Why? I tried really hard making these nice and simple. How's stream quality doing? Is it still fucked? It, it's still pretty much fucked. Oh my god, now I'm at 32,000 bitrate? What the hell? Why did it spike? Oh my god. Now I'm at like 4k or something. Yo, Mr. Geek, yo, what's up? Alright, YouTube isn't really working. I'm seeing some cool titles, but no Doro Hedro. I ha I watched Dororo. Doro Hedro. Oh my god, I judged hard. I hard judged chinchillas. My anime list. Oh my god, people are judging my no, what am I unboxing my dude Reno? I just finished unboxing. I got a motherboard, I got a cooler, and I got ramp. Long time no see yeah. I popped by your conversation with Round Midnight yesterday. He's a good dude. I interviewed him as well. For my first episode of socialization. That's my one-on-one -on -one interview show. I even... Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, I, I think it's because the command is YouTube. Yeah, guys, my YouTube command is... <laughs> Do people not read? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Okay, uh, video. That's my latest YouTube video. But the first part of my interview with Rob Knight, yeah, he's really cool. He's really smart. Obviously, the dude's a doctor. He just graduated from med school. It's a really interesting story. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that he's been going around to a lot of people. Like having three conversations a day. It's absolutely insane the amount of time he's putting into it. I'm very impressed. I am incredibly impressed. I don't know if I'm able to disclose this or not, but uh, this man's going to be expanding. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I think I've pointed him in the in a good direction on moving forward. Not politics, guys, just content wise. I'm not indoctrinating him. I have you guys to indoctrinate. Ah, fuckers don't realize that I'm just turning them into libs. I 
want more boxes, man. I bought a lot of things over Black Friday. I want my boxes. I want to hear the doorbell ring and there be my boxes. Mr. Geek is interesting to talk about as well. French politics is weird as fuck. Yeah, imagine having runoffs. <laughs> oh my god. Wait a second, Chinchilla. You're, you're not even from the United States as well. Netherlands, uh... Is it proportional in Netherlands? That's also weird as fuck. I mean, not really to me. Before comparative politics, before I learned about comparative politics, then it would have been weird as fuck. He is already literally indoctrinated. He is! He is doctorated. He is doctorated. Oh my god, you Europeans. Europeans are so fucking cute. They actually get stuff done. <laughs> They have higher standards of living. They don't know the struggle. <laughs> oh man, having a blast talking to you guys. Having a blast. I'm having so much fun that I don't even want to move on to what I'm supposed to be doing, which is watching the third lecture on power and politics. I'm trying out this new change. A recent conversation with Tory News enlightened me that wait a second except for me because i i think i'm a special case usually people are more serious during the day and want to mellow out at night so then you have a lot more of perhaps maybe the the serious wanting to learn type of audience during the day and then the screaming virtue signaling and the yelling at night and I've been doing the opposite. Because for me, when I wake up, that's the worst. My brain is not fresh in the morning. I probably make the most stupid mistakes in the morning. It's at night when things start really, really turning. I'm like the opposite. So instead of playing games first and then doing the educational stuff i wanted to try out flipping it oh and also some news for you guys why don't you see me blah, 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 blah. i woke up at like 10. <laughs> and i got a lot of work done jeez i i underestimated the amount of time you add to your work day just by waking up early because I got a lot of shit done today. I was very impressed by the work I was able to get out. And I had a lot of time for break and then I took a little nap before stream because I was actually really tired. Yeah, any owls in chat? I wish I could... I wish I could owl out. I used to, but I can't. I'm already... I'm pretty committed to waking up a lot earlier and sleeping a lot earlier and what i mean by that is the sleeping at 1 to 2 a.m and waking up at like 10 and 11 a.m my schedule is all real place during the pandemic yeah probably i mean for me my schedule was like this forever <laughs> in college it was like this too morning classes hell no only afternoon classes and the most degenerate of nights. Oh man. Now I'm thinking about college and I'm sad because college was so much fun. Oh, I'm not even drunk and I'm getting sad. Guys, this is a Sprite. Not sponsored, but please sponsor me. Thank you, Coca Cola. For fulfilling my sugar addiction. How much sugar does this have 38 grams wow yeah i'm probably gonna get health problems in the future i'm still young but if i continue on like this high salt high sugar diets high sugar high salt consumption yeah i'm probably gonna be fucked up in the future but 
now that I'm waking up early, if I wake up even more early, I could actually start doing these things called exer <laughs> exercising. <laughs> Just switch to zero light. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man, if only. If only that was actually a good healthy choice. But it's not. It's even worse. I mean, what's really good is that I've still been consuming a l enough of my H2O liquids. I gotta keep this face, this skin, as hydrated as possible. <clears throat> oh damn, this song is... This song is nice. Let's just chill for a little bit. How many of you aren't followers? You're not following? That's okay. Senpai still appreciates you. Senpai still notices you. Senpai wants you to follow my... I'm just being a sundere. And not telling you how I feel. Not like I want your follow. Ha! Ah! That's the cindery. <laughs> I don't know. People keep dying from diabetes, and I haven't seen anybody OD on aspirin. <laughs> Following since the good day of the A4 Auditorium. Yeah, man. I miss A4 Auditorium. And now on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. EST, hey, <laughs> four hours later, man, A4 used to start at four. That was actually a really nice time slot because it was right around when I woke up. So I was always there. But it was all Asian everything. A panel of just Asian people moderated by me, produced by stories underscore as underscore models happening bi-weekly so not today haha <laughs> people didn't know that not today i didn't tell anybody not today but it's going to be happening next week we already have topics lined up we already have a list of panelists lined up thank you diet sock them for referring another panelist another potential panelist going to be reaching out to them soon my god, Discord actually did something for me. Oh, by the way, I'm really bad at Discord. Senpai needs to be carried. It's not like I want you to carry the Discord, but you know, like if you do it, then you do it. I can't stop you from making the Discord interactive. So, like, what can I do? It's not like I look forward to it. I don't expect it at all. God, is this how Sundrays really behave? Jesus Christ. I think he just said some weep shit again. <laughs> Man, there's a lot of things that... I don't talk about anime a lot. Which is something I just realized. I don't talk about anime a lot. Oh yeah, it was just fun. I think Kurt uh, TD was gonna ask. Yeah, Kurt Twitch debate. What a dude. Has helped me a lot. It's helping others a lot. A big helper of Prime. I know he's been working with Polar too. I don't feel special anymore, but you know what? It's okay, he, he could have he could have multiple. Just like waifus, he could have multiple. Yeah, but I really don't talk about anime a lot on this stream, and I am a Huge, huge anime fan. I'm pretty sure Sunglasses Cat is still going to be judging my anime list, but it's a decent list. I'm almost going to be reaching 100 shows. Not 100 shows. Holy shit. Now I passed out way. I passed out. Oh my God. In high school. Uh, 100 days of anime watched. Mm -hmm. Recently, I started watching Morality, The Patriot. You're actually not good at anime? Whew! Yeah, because I high-key judge other people's my anime list. Like, whenever I talk to somebody about anime, most of the time I'm disappointed. Like, there's only been a couple of people who have out-animated me. And 
whenever somebody says, yeah, I watch anime, and then I start questioning them. I'm all excited and everything. Oh, yeah! We get really deep! It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. No, it really does work out. I just come out disappointed and sad. Uh, what I think about Princess Mononoke? Good, good film. Good Ghibli film. Way ahead of its time when it comes to animation. Story is good. Story is very deep. If you know anything about uh, Shinto, Shintoism, the Japanese religion, like Japan is like 99% Shinto, by the way, then you'll, you'll understand the metaphors. It's very symbolic. Just think about the elements of industrialism going against nature and nature fighting back and balance in the world. <laughs> think of it along those lines and oh, it starts making sense. I just know several titles. Oh, yeah, that's what you need. Do I remember the MMA fighter from A4 Oratorium like two months ago? Uh, no, I don't. Female Asian fights out of the best MMA. Oh, wait! I do remember! Yeah! Wait, I, I totally forgot her name. No, she does. she's not political at all. I remember her saying that she was not political, but I think she had a really good take that day. I have no idea if I was on that panel or not. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure she's friends with Andre, and if I wanted to get in touch with her, I could get in touch with Andre and get him to refer me to her. I definitely want to talk anime with you. Oh yeah, we will. We definitely will. I won't shit on you for just watching One Piece. But who knows? You can never see the inner thoughts of a Cinderay, can you? I'm being really much of a Cinderay today. Is it Tinzilla on Twitch? Maybe, maybe. I'm interested, so I'm gonna try to get in touch with Andre. One Piece best anime ever. <laughs> oh, speaking of anime, oh, what's up? What's up, Nick? Yeah, hi, it's been a while. Yeah, did you know we, we moved guilds to Echion? Her record is insane. She has like 18 wins by submission out of 27 wins and 4 losses. Holy shit. Yeah, what have you been up to? Wow. How's Genshin? I've been playing Genshin too, but you're probably a lot further than me. I haven't been playing a lot of Genshin. How's Sanjo Gahara? Uh, I mean, Gene for you. Yeah, speaking of WoW, I still got stuck in Activision Blizzard. Very glad I held on, because it dipped a little bit when everything else dipped. A couple hundred points. I'm positive now, guys. Capitalism for the win. Guys, I'm not a sock them because... Because I have to. I have vested interest. While wow, kind of taking over Genshin though? Yeah, it makes sense because it's a big patch. But I'm sure once Genshin comes out with like maybe the new area, it'll come back. You know what? What's nice is that I think for Genshin, it punishes you, it punishes you less for not doing things every day, unlike Maple Story. Mm -hmm. Considering that there are seven statues of goddesses or gods, and we've only visited lands of two, so that means uh, probably five more areas, five more countries. Yeah. There's gonna be a lot of content for Genshin. I'm in no rush. I'm in no rush. I've missed a lot of events, I've missed a lot of opportunities, but I don't feel guilty. Especially because I've moved away from video game content to a combination of video game content and political content. And then also moving away from Twitch. Oh my god. I did not expect I would be in my current position right now a couple months ago. Yeah. These are very interesting developments that are happening. 
like like they're spontaneous but it's all very well thought out and planned sure you kind of find it weird to see free market people who don't actually own any capital i stop and think why are they advocating for this this does nothing for you <laughs> it doesn't so it, it pro one they either have some vested interest in the actual ideology or the actual makeup of society that is that is not me uh why i have stock is because i see an opportunity to gain capital to enrich myself to get out of debt <laughs> to make investments and things like that uh it's a way to sustain a living or at least like i see an option i have it I'm not doing anything with it, so why not put into something where it could actually grow? Things like that. That's for my purposes. I'll disclose that. It's okay, it doesn't matter. I'll still be called a, a pig capitalist. Whereas for other people who don't have any invested capital, well... It's just as valid for them to argue the way that they argue just because they think it's right or just because they think... It's how society ought to look like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is fine too. Now, if they really like, it was kind of weird for me to not place any bets on the presidential election, despite how confident I was in Biden winning. The reason why is because I didn't realize, I didn't know how it worked. <laughs> Trust me, I I would have earned easy money if I had known about predict or blah 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 because i'm pretty sure it was throughout summer that's when i started seeing that biden was gonna win or he had a very very large advantage i just didn't realize i didn't know how it worked the next time though i will you know i was actually thinking about playing putting bets on the georgia election the two Senate runoffs. And then I looked at the poll and I was like, nah, it's way too close. No, 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 no. This is a this is a toss-up, guys. Georgia is gonna be really close. I would not make any predictions at all. If I were to make place bets, I would figure out a way where if I was wrong, I would minimize losses but then that would also mean that i would have to uh, minimize gains <clears throat> then let's see uh how this would work is if i think dems were going to win i would put like a hundred dollars on dems but then i'll put fifty dollars on republicans so then if i either way it's like is that a, it's either going to be a fifty dollar loss or a yeah it would it would be a fifty dollar loss and a, or a fifty dollar gain mm -hmm. or I could just put fifty dollars on dem and then zero on Republican and boom that'd just be fifty dollar loss or gain something like that would that ha would that how it be work? Yeah, see, I still don't know. So if I don't know about it, I'm not going to do it. Guys, don't put money into something that you don't understand. <laughs> That's not a good recipe. Hey, you could get lucky. R slash Wall Street bets. But I'll tell you, most of the time, a, a lot of the gains on Wall Street bets is cherry picking. The gains for it... They're not showing you the all time. <laughs> yeah, maybe they gained 50k in a day, but over time they lost like 100 or 200. And you're like, ah, is it really worth it? Probably not. Hey, I understand. When I look at it, when I look at R slash Wall Street bets, I'm thinking to myself, oh man, if I were in that position, if I made the same exact decisions, I would be debt free. I would be paying off scalpers. I'd have my PS5 that I would never use just so I could have the PS5. 
Maybe even be an asshole and sell the box on eBay for $500. That's work. I don't know, man. You're telling me to learn stats. I know enough stats in order to tell other people who don't know stats how to do stats and how they're not doing stats. I know enough for that. And I also knew enough to know that Biden was going to win. <laughs> but something like for Georgia would have to be something deeper, definitely. I'm pretty sure I looked at the polls yesterday. It's just, it's so close. The margins are at 1, 48, 49, 50, 51. They're neck and neck. I don't know which way it's going to swing. It's weird though, but Biden won Georgia, so... If we just took all the Biden voters and turned them to Dems, then yeah, right? Wouldn't that be a Dem Georgia? But no, there could be split vote, split ticket voting. And I, I wouldn't even know if the split ticket voting would matter. It's like we could always say that, yes, there's going to be split ticket voting, but at what point does it become significant? At what point does it actually change results, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? That's something that I nobody knows. At least I think nobody knows. Maybe somebody does know. Mm, maybe as it gets closer and there's more information to work with, then I'll I could be more confident about it and I'll let you guys know. Just for validity's sake, you know. I can't be like, oh, I knew Biden was going to win and then not tell you guys until after the fact. That's kind of... That's not post hoc rationalization. That is uh, post hoc evidence. But I said he was going to win in summer. I have nothing to prove that. Just trust me. I have witnesses. At least two. Red, gray, blue, and osmosis. Speaking of osmosis... We put a bet. We fucking put a bet. I'm not gonna chase him down for it. It wasn't anything serious. I think uh, I'm pretty sure he just wanted to grind my gears. All right, chat died, and that's okay because we're gonna be watching for something very resident sleeper. Politics and. Our lecture three. Changes to the politics stream. Holly. Thy. Stream. Our and. Politics Lecture 3 Update Close Nightbot Not close Just gonna pause it I've always loved sci-fi And the idea of being right on the edge No! Shut up Today we're going to be talking about the international architecture of what I'm calling the early post-Cold War world. And by early, I'm really focusing on the time from the collapse of communism until the financial crisis of 2008. Because we're going to see that, that, that ushered in pretty big structural changes in both in the, uh, within a lot of the uh, countries we're going to be talking about and in international uh, political economy and in international relations. Um, our agenda, we're going to talk about 
NATO expansion after the Cold War. We're going to talk about the Washington Consensus, and then we're going to talk about the European Union, uh, its enlargement, and its challenges. Okay. So from these three bullet points, we can talk about three types of narratives. First, starting with the NATO expansion. This is the expansion of collective security around the world, the fall of the Warsaw Pact. A lot of conversations slash debates about whether or not NATO is still needed now that the Cold War is over, now that the Soviet Union is gone, et cetera, et cetera. Depending on who you're going to be listening to about the NATO expansion, it's either going to be framed as imperialist or it's going to be framed as a pursuit of international security, at least for the U.S. and its allies. Then you have, two, the Washington Consensus. This is really the the push of neoliberalism onto the world. Now that the Soviet Union has fallen, now that communism is weakening, capitalism, the free market, especially on the international scale, has a lot of room to grow and has a lot of countries to influence. So you have institutions, international institutions, Taken, not taken control, but influenced by the United States, such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, able to commit, uh, what's that term called, where, I forget, but they have to do certain things and then in order to get certain stuff, um, solid, no, it's, it's, does it start with an S? It's escaping my mind. So you have the, the push of neoliberalism onto the world via the Washington Consensus, and then the development of not just international organizations within the United Nations, but a large, robust regional organization in the form of the European Union. And I am willing to bet that a lot of regions are going to, in the far future, maybe not the near future, but in the far future, try to replicate what the EU has been doing in the form of the African Union or in South America. There are some regional bodies there. You have the Association of Southeast Nation Nations in Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So a more of a specific focus in international relations on a regional scale, not just an international scale. So it's kind of weird, the path of what's being developed. At the very beginning, it was states, and then the globe in the form of the United Nations, or before that, if you want to talk about the League of Nations, but that was crap. And then the EU and other regional bodies. And there are both pros and cons to what a regional body is able to provide. But these are the three narratives that I at least just talked about. And those are three really big ones. I'm not sure if... <laughs> I'm pretty sure when we're going to be talking about the Washington Consensus we're going to get a more accurate picture of what neoliberalism is than what is being complained about <laughs> from online leftists, <laughs> at least from what I see about online leftists and people calling each other neolibs and stuff like that. It's kind of funny. Oh, was Washington Consensus that neoliberal thing that replaced Keynesian economics? Uh, no, 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 no. It, it wasn't something that replaced Keynesian. What really replaced Keynesian economics was Reaganomics. Keynesian economics is more of a, at least from what I know, it had more of an impact on domestic economics rather than international economics. The Washington Consensus was a, more so a platform, a, a number of policies 
meant to disperse around the world to other countries. So, which actually does kind of align with Reaganomics. It involves less government spending, more privatization. Okay, yeah, it actually does probably coincide a lot with Reaganomics, but it's very different. As a means to get countries out of debt and to get them to be more quote unquote free market, boost free trade, less tariffs, no sanctions, things like that. This was the neoliberal approach to world trade. Not a lot of protectionism and a lot of cooperation when it comes to the freedom of labor, the movement of labor, and blah, blah, blah. Is this like an undergrad stream? Well, I graduated from undergrad, so it is not an undergrad stream. It is a post-undergrad stream. But yeah, it's a poli-sci stream, and we're watching lecture three of the Power and Politics lecture from Yale. We've watched the first two already on other days. We just started a lecture three, so solemn air. Want to stick around? Please do. And watch the other lectures later. We'll be moving on to four on Saturday. But yeah, those are the three things that I could talk about just from the introduction, this first slide here. So it's a pretty big menu. I do want to take a minute to say something about uh, three lenses for thinking about politics. One of the problems with political science is that people, people tend not to say in words of one syllable what they can say in words of five syllables. Um, and so there's an awful lot of terminology, terminology and jargon, <laughs> and it's my ambition to uh, use as little of this as possible. Um, but I do want to alert you uh, to, to three different ways of thinking about politics that to some extent compete and to some extent are complementary. All right, what are these three things? I'm going to say populist, academic, What's the, what would be the third one? Machiavellian, maybe? Somebody who was willing to use both? Hmm. The first is one that focuses on right, where people's we <laughs> interests. Um, you, you might think of Marxism as, as focusing on people's economic interests, but also um, formal rational choice models of politics um, that use economic approaches to politics focus on people's individual interests. Oh, uh, maybe it's realist. It's interest-based. And, and we... Now, uh, wouldn't realist already be for interest? Because that's, real, that's what realism says, is that people are rational and they think for their own self-interest. So isn't that already... Think about uh, just common folk wisdom about politics. People expect people to do things that are in their interest. I'm not going to be a cindery. I like you. move into the realm of international relations... There's a little shame this delay. This interest-based way of looking at the world sometimes traffics under the title of realism. That the realists in international relations are people Got me who beat. say that uh, countries follow their individual interests. Now, not every interest-based theory of international politics is realist, because there are some who say, well, yeah, but the, you've got to look at the domestic politics of countries and how that influences what they do internationally. So they might still be interest-based, but they're not going to take countries as their basic unit of analysis. So but what? The, the, the idea realist, behind liberal, realism, behind constructivist? The, uh, all of these different... Uh, schools I've just mentioned is that if you want to understand what's going to happen Are those the in three politics, ways of thinking about politics? look at the interests of the relevant actors. Might have different theories about that, but so on. Interest-based. The second basic lens that people bring to bear on politics is about institutions. Yeah, uh, that's and here in domestic <laughs> politics, it might be people who think independent courts and the separation of powers are important, that they structure what happens. Others think, no, it's the kinds of political parties, but institutional arrangements uh, are important. When we think about the international system, 
So institutionalists got travel under various labels again. They call them liberal institutionalists, some of them, um, but they have sometimes they just call themselves institutionalists. But I kind of have to address what's being said by Dysuck Dem. I don't think I went through what the realist school is about. I saw LSP describe nuclear peace theory as a crazy suicidal realist. Yes, they are crazy suicidal realists. Do you want me to explain about the realist school? And what they really think about? I'm pretty sure I've done it on stream and I've done it with you in chat. Yeah, so why nuclear peace theory is crazy suicidal is because it suggests that everybody gets a nuclear weapon, and because everybody has a nuclear weapon, everybody is subject to, whatchamacallit, uh, mutual assured destruction, therefore peace. Which is really dumb, because that's just going to increase tension, increase risk, increase the security dilemma, and for all countries to have that, it's really bad. It doesn't, it doesn't take too long. Uh, it could take really long. So if doing this right on the spot could be a little bit difficult. Your traditional realists are people who think about self-interest. Rational actors. You got your Machiavelli. You have your Hobbes. It's kind of selfish. It's kind of pessimistic. It's kind of dangerous. And then you move on to your neorealism, which focuses on the states. Not people, no longer kings and soldiers or a person, but states. And their primary objective is to secure national peace not national peace, national security, and the longevity of their country. The number one priority is security and survival. And then from neorealism, you have a divergence between defensive realism and offensive realism. In offensive realism, you want to, well, it's in the word, go on the offensive. You want to start attacking or start neutralizing threats abroad in order to secure your own security. Yeah, secure your own security. You understand what I mean. Whereas defensive realism is, in the word, defensive. Strengthening yourself, etc., etc. Now, when you're thinking along the lines of security as a realist, when it comes to relationships between other countries and the balance of power it's relative you're not looking at who is stronger and who is weaker what you really want to look at over time is who is gaining ground at what rate so if say we were to quantify military power for bullshit reasons but well, let's say we could quantify military power, which we probably can't, but this is bullshit what's coming out of my mouth. The United States was at 100. China was at 50. Now the next year, the United States is at 110, so there's an increase. But China went from 50 to 75. That's a 25% increase. Now, at face value, this is pretty okay. The United States is still far ahead. The United States is still stronger than China, but for the realist, this is a loss. Because this suggests that over time, China is going to be taking over the United States. Because the United States is growing slower than China. So, that is to focus on relative gains rather than absolute gains. And then you have a bunch of other theories coming from realism such as, probably a really good one, mutually assured destruction. But then again, you could also explain mutual assured destruction through norms and uh, neoliberal in institutionalism, even that. 
Uh, so realism suggests that when it comes to game theory, that both actors are going to choose the bad choice because they're looking out for their own self-interest. That's prisoner to, mainly prisoner's dilemma. So realists go on the prisoner's dilemma side of things. It argues that both actors are going to want to protect itself against others. And then neoliberalism comes in and says, wait a second, if we had a third party, if we established rules and we laid down communications between the actors, then they will both realize that choosing the best option for both of them is the best choice. Etc, etc. So, a lot of realism assumes almost a very old style of politics of it's very interest-based. It assumes a lack of communication, a lack of transparency, and not a lot of respect to norms. Because the only norm for a realist is their norm of survival, the use of violence for self-defense, and for their own longevity. New realism is simply bourgeoisie state pragmatism. Yeah, yeah, it's it's more state focused. Do not forget the idealist respect of realism that argues its pragmatism is necessary to maintain national freedom for subjects of the state. Whoa, whoa, I've never heard of that before, but that's interesting. Idealist respect of realism. There's nothing ideal about realism. But what you're saying after that is that that argues its pragmatism is necessary to maintain national freedom for subjects of the state. Yes. So when it comes to not necessarily realist schools, but say neocons. So if we, if we were to talk about neoconservatives in the United States arguing for what are sort of realist policies, but not really, because a lot of realists don't like neocons, because they're more on the defensive side than the offensive side. Offensive realism is more stupid than defensive realism, but both are stupid in their own ways. Uh, I think the ideal is that, oh yes, we are going to pursue our security for the sake and like our pragmatic security for the sake of the freedom of our people because if we don't then people are going to die and that's not really free and they're doing this in order to justify their policies when really it's it's more of like a ruse i've never heard that democracy comes at a cost out of a mount mouths of realists no because i've met very little realists i i've i haven't really spoken to a lot of realists i imagine i would be able to speak to a lot of realists if i say went to a conference and i had a military base but i didn't i never did no uh Especially for me, in my undergrad experience, the longer that you stuck in the school, seeing like, I imagine being a freshman, there were more realists than liberals and constructivists. But then as they learn more, they start to realize that, wait a second, realism actually doesn't make sense. No, it does make sense. It's just not as true as it used to be. So then people started to become liberals and constructivists over time. Okay, no worries. I see. Okay, I think I have a general idea about what it is. Okay, that's good. That's good. LSP, what LSP said is true. Nuclear peace theory is crazy suicidal. And... Yes, the hardcore realists would 
agree to something like nuclear peace theory because they really believe in mutually assured destruction. <laughs> but it's bad. And it's not going to work. And it's not going to happen. It's definitely not going to happen. At that point, really, my strongest argument to them is, well, sure, you could argue for this, but good luck trying to get that to happen. <laughs> yeah, good luck getting other countries to want to get a nuclear weapon and get everybody other country to have a nuclear weapon. So, like, the best thing about what we have right now is that uh, countries would rather have everybody not have a nuclear weapon and themselves not have a nuclear weapon than them having a nuclear weapon and everybody else has a nuclear weapon. Hmm. At least that's conventional wisdom. Okay, so that's realism. That's a crash course of realism. I think I did a pretty good job. There's definitely a lot more to it. We talked about security dilemma before. That comes from realism. Overall, just think about states, security, survival, and relative strength. And the relative strength is not to be compared with absolute strength. They're two different things. Relative strength is what realists want to fo focus on. Interest. It's plain and simple, but they look at international institutions, things like the United Nations. NATO is a kind of institution. It's an alliance. It's not, it's not an international Okay, he, here institution. he's talking it's about alliance, neoliberal it, institutionalism, it institutional or just institutionalism. Presence. So this second lens focuses on institutional arrangements, uh, which may or may not be consistent with the way people's interests line up. Right? So, for instance, George Kennan, who I mentioned to you last time, thought the United Nations was a waste of time because countries always behave in their interests. And if the UN told them to do something that wasn't in their interest, they would ignore it. Um, so that, there you can, you can see uh, possible tensions between institutionalist and interest-based accounts. Um, Rosa Luxemburg is famous for saying, the rivers of history run through the most finely meshed statute. So again, it's an, a Marxist view that interests are gonna prevail and institutional stuff is irrelevant. And then the third I'm putting under the heading of ideals, and this can be ideas, culture, um, norms, uh, Jesus things Christ. other than interests and institutions that affect what actually happens in politics. And again, people disagree a lot about some hard-boiled realists will say hey, norms, and norms and institution are all uh, beside the point. Others think norms are very important and that they actually structure what happens. Again, here there's lots of fancy terminology to capture this notion. There's something called constructivism in international <laughs> relations theory is basically a theory of normative behavior, norms shaping outcomes. And so a lot of the, the, the squabbling in the, in the academic journals and so on is I among love how he just takes a shit on all of this on, terminology. <laughs> on interests, on institutions, or on ideas. And uh, my own view, just putting my cards on the table before we dig into today is that it, it's the, to say which is the right one is the wrong question, uh, and it's better to sta try and understand what are the conditions under which <laughs> interests <laughs> tend to prevail or institutions <laughs> tend to prevail or norms can restructure things. And those conditions change, and uh, they, they are, there's often much more play, there's, it, there's sometimes much more play for norms, say, than at other times like when the Cold War collapses and the institutional architectures up That sucked if I need to be pretentious. If I'm not pretentious, then what, what did I pay for college? Or not out, out there. But in the middle of the Cold War, when everybody's locked no. into positions that are uh, highly, highly rigid, then ideas are probably largely going to be beside the point. So I, that, that's the way I will tend to use these notions, and you will see them coming up uh, obviously today, but uh, throughout the course. Okay, 
So let's think about uh, the first post-Cold War international security crisis, which was prompted by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in late 1990. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Ground forces are not engaged. This conflict started August 2nd when the dictator of Iraq invaded a small and helpless neighbor. Kuwait, a member of the Arab League and a member of the United Nations, was crushed. Its people brutalized. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. This military action, taken in accord with United Nations resolutions and with the consent of the United States Congress, follows months of constant and virtually endless diplomatic, diplomatic activity on the part of the United Nations, the United States, and many, many other countries. Arab leaders sought what became known as an Arab solution, only to conclude that Saddam Hussein was unwilling to leave Kuwait. Others traveled to Baghdad in a variety of efforts to restore peace and justice. Our Secretary of State, James Baker, held an historic meeting in Geneva, only to be totally rebuffed. This past weekend, in a last-ditch effort, the Secretary General of the United Nations went to the Middle East with peace in his heart, his second such mission, and he came back from Baghdad with no progress at all in getting Saddam Hussein wow. to withdraw they just from Kuwait. Fuck on the Secretary now, General. The 28 countries with forces in the Gulf area have exhausted all reasonable efforts to reach a peaceful resolution, have no choice but to drive Saddam from Kuwait by force. We will not fail. As I report to you, air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. We are determined to knock out Saddam Hussein's nuclear bomb potential. We will also destroy his chemical weapons facilities. Our objectives are clear. Saddam Hussein's forces will leave Kuwait. The legitimate government of Kuwait will be restored to its rightful place. No WMDs, and by Kuwait the way. And will once again be free. Iraq Actually, will eventually maybe, maybe comply time. with all relevant United Nations resolutions. Hmm, good question. And then, when peace is restored, it is our hope that Iraq will live as a peaceful and cooperative member of the family of nations. I had hoped that when the United States Congress in historic debate, took its resolute action, Saddam would realize he could not prevail and would move out of Kuwait in accord with the United Nations resolutions. He did not do that. Instead, he remained intransigent, certain that time was on his side. Saddam was warned over and over again to comply with the will of the United Nations leave Kuwait or be driven out. Saddam has arrogantly rejected all warnings. Instead, he tried to make this a dispute between Iraq and the United States of America. Well, he failed. Tonight, 28 nations, countries from five continents, Europe and Asia, Africa and the Arab League, have forces in the Gulf area standing shoulder to shoulder against Saddam Hussein. These countries had hoped God, the use of time force to be avoided. Saying like that. Regrettably, we now believe that only force will make him leave. From the irks inside. So that was the first Gulf War, so-called Operation Desert Storm. As President Bush said there, it was, it was authorized. This is Resolution 678, which I will post, and you can peruse at your leisure. I do want to notice that, uh, just notice that it, it was authorized by the Security Council um, with Cuba and Yemen voting against. They were temporary members of the Security Council. The way the Security Council works is any one of the five permanent members can veto it. 
uh, and China chose to abstain, but it didn't veto it. Uh, and uh, Soviet Union uh, supported it. So, um, I want to, I, I start with this because I want to point out several things about uh, what Bush did. He, he certainly was, the, the U.S. was certainly not blameless in this whole affair, and I don't want to, I don't want to uh, sugarcoat uh, every aspect of what President Bush did in this regard. There was heavily, he was heavily criticized uh, later for having apparently signaled to uh, Saddam Hussein that it would be okay with the U.S. if they went into Kuwait. He was also criticized for encouraging a Shiite uprising in southern Kuwait and then not supporting it uh, after we left. So oh, um, there, there are grounds for criticizing what we did. But, I did not know that. Um, the things I want to point out is, first of all, it was an action of last resort. The, every, every effort, as he said in the video, had been made to end this without an invasion. Uh, secondly, it was proportional. Stop the bully without becoming one. Bush took a lot of criticism for this. People said, you should go to Baghdad. You should knock off this regime. And he steadfastly refused to do it, um, partly because uh, of the uh, fact that he was not behaving unilaterally. As he indicated, there was a genuine coalition, including every Arab country except Jordan, uh, was actually participating in this. And he knew that if he did more than the UN uh, mandate, the Security Council resolution mandated, the coalition would collapse. Um, so it was a broad-based co coalition with strong regional support to uh, stop the bully without becoming a bully. Uh, that is to say, this aggression will not be tolerated. And this, as I said, was the first international security crisis of the post-Cold War world. And had that become the template going forward, uh, we would be in a very different place today. Well, that's one but of the things wasn't. I'm going to be arguing to you later in the course, because as it turns out, uh, it was one of the paths not taken to treat the way in which Saddam Hussein had been expelled from uh, Kuwait as perhaps norm setting for the future handling of international security crises. It was a path not taken. Okay, let's talk about NATO. Uh, what is the point of his argument here? Those same Arab states mutually agreed against the existence of Israel. No, he, there is no argument here. So he's explaining why the United States didn't go into Iraq in order to overthrow Saddam Hussein, despite there being pressure domestically from the administration and from advisors to, to for the United States to do so is because it was a coalition and from inside the coalition they only agreed to expelling Saddam Hussein and Iraqi forces from Kuwait and they stopped at the border. I'm pretty sure that if it wasn't for the coalition and if it wasn't for other actors such as the United Nations and neighboring states, that the United States would have gladly gone over the borders and taken down Saddam Hussein. This is something that we know when it comes to Bush Jr. looking at what his father did and wanting to accomplish what his father could not. Which, yeah, we know with the benefit of hindsight that Bush Jr. was able to, when president, get forces inside of Iraq, overthrow Saddam Hussein, and, well, well, that's another discussion. The ar there is no argument here. He's saying that the Operation Desert Storm was... Not a turning point nor an inflection point, but a very significant event post Cold War, or it not being as significant as it could have been. He suggested that the that Operation Desert Storm could have been norm setting. It could have set a precedent 
for the future of interventions, humanitarian and military. But it didn't. And he later said at the very end that if it was like that, if we did look back on Operation Desert Storm as the example, as the thing to replicate for future interventions, then the world that we're living in right now would have been a lot different. Let's think about all the interventions since Operation Desert Storm that could have happened differently or just could have happened at all if we had just followed what was done for Operation Desert Storm. The thing is that it wasn't. Is that since then, is that since then, especially the United States Administration on Foreign Policy has not looked to things such as norms. They have followed their, their own beat of their drum, their own mandate. There's the Bush Doctrine. Then there's the Obama Doctrine. Then there's America First. They're all very different. Now, like, what if those were heavily influenced by what was precedent? That was the first, first major international event since the fall of the Cold War, is what he is suggesting. And it could have had a huge impact on future events, but it didn't because nobody followed. Or nobody had, maybe you can argue that nobody had interest to follow, or maybe it wasn't a strong enough norm. We could go through multiple arguments as to why it was a norm setting. The reality is that it was a norm setting. That's the reality. His own fucked it up. Yeah, yeah, he did. His own son was like, as well as people within the Republican Party. So it's not just his own son, even though his own son was the president. It was also Dick Cheney who had vested interest in the oil companies, wanted to uh, privatize those oil companies or get access to privatized oil companies, the oil in Iraq. That's Dick Cheney. And then Bush Jr. gave a lot of control of foreign operations, especially when it came to the war on terror, to Dick Cheney. And then you had a bunch of people within the Republican Party, let's name, for example, John Bolton. Maybe Mike Pompeo. I have no idea if he was an actor then. Uh, maybe he was on the younger side at that time. But a lot of neoconservatives in the Republican Party that fully believed that taking down Saddam Hussein militarily was the best choice. And that Bush made the wrong choice. Bush the first made the wrong choice. And then he became a first-term president. A lot of Republicans, just voters... Thought that probably thought that was the wrong choice. I, I wouldn't know. Maybe, maybe that's that's that there's potential for that. It feels like this line of reasoning is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of why the particular interventions occurred and their ends. Um, th th this line of reasoning, what line of reasoning? Okay, and what's the misunderstanding? Uh, it feels like so maybe it feels like, but so you don't know. Um, what what could the misunderstanding be? No, um, at the very in the very first lecture, he is he already outed himself as a theorist, so that's his main occupation. Despite like being a professor and wanting to dabble in everything for the sake of teaching a course, he's mainly a theorist, so he likes to think about oh what about like the what if questions. So this is potentially one of his what ifs, and it's a pretty big what if. And I'll give him credit for that. It's a pretty big what if. I can see a lot of changes to just the world <laughs> if we had used Operation Desert Storm as a prime example of how we intervene into other countries. Because not only does this change norms of intervention, but it changes norms of sovereignty. It changes norms of rights. It changes norms of humanitarianism, human rights, etc., etc. It changes a lot. 
uh, there's a lot of not introspection. Uh, you, you can argue intersectionality <laughs> when it comes to laws and norms. Just everything international. I've been told it might be appropriate to think of Dick Cheney almost as a co-president. Yeah, in a way. In a way, he was like a co-president. One of the reasons, and thank you. Thank you, the movie Cheney. Excellent movie. I have no idea if it's accurate or not. Um, I'm Cheney was unprecedentedly a very, very active vice president. And he was involved in a lot of state affairs, especially foreign affairs. And this is because Bush Jr. was not very strong in foreign policy. That was one of his weaknesses. And bringing on Dick Cheney would not only have made his own administration strong, but his own reputation within the Republican Party. And this reputation is really important because you want the party of your, you want the support of your party you don't want them to be reluctant about it you want their absolute support you want their absolute energy of your party in order to get elected this was a good strategy and vice presidents since then have been selected in order to fill in gaps biden was very well respected among the senate He's had many years in the Senate and knows how to compromise within the legislative chamber. This filled in the gap for Obama, who was young, was a, I don't know, like a one term or a two term, but didn't even finish his second term Senate. Did not have that reputation, did not have that clout amongst the party as well as amongst the legislature. Biden filled that in. Hence, an evangelical grabbing that support as well as a strong figure within the Republican Party, building gaps for Trump, who was an outsider, who was a businessman, who was cruel and crude, not very Christian. Now, we know that he was able to rift his way for the evangelical vote but in 2016 Pence contributed a lot to that Kamala Harris for Joe Biden let's check off all of the identity politics boxes woman person of color Asian American African American during a time of racial unrest black lives matter Yeah, okay. Good Good thing I was rambling on about vice presidents because I was waiting for Shalmar to uh, write a paragraph that I was expecting. The undergriding justification of the second Gulf War is that the job was unfinished. Undergrading. Okay, this is something that I said. Um, yeah, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait was not the start or the end of the U.S. antagonism with Iraq. It was always a matter of asserting American authority in the region. Talking about only the intervention aspect ignores the context of Iraq as a problem state for the U.S. decades prior to Desert Storm. I think this is untrue, especially when Saddam Hussein has had many relations and often good relations with the United States. We've sent in Secretary of State to meet with Saddam Hussein, handshake, write agreements, etc., etc. It was at that time at that time, for exchanges of oil. And then all of a sudden, Saddam Hussein started to fuck up, and then we wanted to uh, get the help of Iran in order to, and then we started the Iran-Iraq war, and then that didn't go so well, and the Iran started to become a problem state for us. For the interest, it's still at the end of the, end of the day, uh, we can boil it down to almost probably incorrectly, uh, but I'm doing it right now, reduce it down to an interest for oil, and then when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait for land reasons, because he believed that Kuwait rightfully belonged historically to Iraq, then, oh my god, well guess what Kuwait has? Kuwait has oil, and that oil is being given to what is probably the United States. So, it's weird because we only started to label problem states as problem states, though albeit they were problem states before, 
but we didn't call them the axes of evil until Bush Jr. We didn't call them the axes of evil until Bush Jr. So yes, okay. In a sense, in that explanation, we did not touch upon the history, the broad history, the relationships, the historical relationship between the United States and Iraq. Yes, I'll give you that. But the significance of it being a part of this lecture is not explaining why it happened, but explaining what happened and why it's important to know what happened and what it could have been. What are the implications? Now, if you think the history has, uh, if, if you think understanding the history more can lead to a better realization of the implications or why it didn't imply this and that, maybe, okay, I think that would be a better point to target. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe our, our understanding so far has been pretty warped, and because of our understanding is being warped, we don't realize that it makes sense why it wasn't as significant as the lecturer is making it out to be. Didn't we back Iraq against Iran a bunch of times before Iran had a revolution? Yes! Yes, we did. The United States played both sides. 100%. This is true. Uh, the idea that these relations were good rather than opportunistic is quite short-sighted. I agree. There was nothing sudden about this long-standing bad relationship with the United States. Yeah, well, we could say the same thing about all other states, is that they're, they're only opportunistic and none of them are actually good, unless take, for example, our closest allies. Um... So, I, I think... I think you're still missing the point of the lecture. And this is this is fine. Like if you want to contend on certain points because you want to learn, ask questions or clarify or something or even argue back for the sake of arguing, uh which is good because uh something might come up might come out that's good for both of us or one of us, I hope at least. Still my point is that Kind of beating around the bush. Unless it's related to the significance. I want to see like an okay and then we can move on before we actually move on. Because I don't want to start listening about NATO and then go back to talking about Iraq and Operation Desert Sword and the Second Gulf War. All right. Oh, go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I, by the way, I did my, I was supposed to do my honors thesis in interventions. It didn't happen because COVID fucked me up. I didn't get COVID, but the, the stress and all that uh, was not the best environment. It was not the best environment for me to write my paper. So I definitely do see where this professor is coming from. Because Operation Desert Storm really was a successful, it went off without a hitch, it accomplished its goals, it was multilateral, there were not a lot of complaints. As the lecturer said, it stopped the bully without being a bully. It was really the ideal example of military humanitarian intervention. It wasn't something like the, the like South Korea, where all of a sudden we invaded North Korea and then China pushed us back to the line. Or it wasn't something like Nate, uh, Vietnam, where it wasn't an intervention, but for U.S. policy, foreign, it was only one country. And when you only have one country going into it, you don't have other countries to balance you out about your interests. It's quite selfish. This was very, very ideal, and it worked. And it wasn't replicated. It's sad. Because as I said before, imagine all the other interventions in the future. If it was done in a similar fashion or in mind with the intents and purposes of looking back at what Operation Death of Storm did. One, 
they could have been successful. Lives would have been saved. And the world would have been, I would argue, better, better. Yes, yes, I'll, I held alongside Yugoslavia as the ideal intervention, but my point is completely elsewhere. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. What, I'm not. when, and why? So NATO is a creature of the Cold War. Um, and it's, I've already mentioned the United Nations several times today, and it's important to think about NATO uh, and the origins of NATO uh, alongside the creation of the United Nations because they were created both in the 1940s. After World War I, they had a t Woodrow Wilson had wanted to create a League of Nations, and that had failed largely because the American uh, uh, Congress wouldn't go along with it, and, oft, and FDR had, during World War II, greatly invested in the idea that there must be uh, an institution of this general sort uh, created after World War II to prevent nations from going to war. And when um, President Truman came into office, he made, it, um, he made it his business to make sure that that happened. Uh, and so here you can see President Truman addressing the conference in San Francisco in April uh, of 1945 as they were drawing up the Charter of the UN. There were many who doubted that agreement could ever be reached by these 50 countries differing so much in race, and religion, language, and culture. But these differences were all forgotten in one unshakable unity of determination to find a way to end war. <laughs> if we had had this charter a few years ago, and above all, the will to use it, millions now dead would be alive. If we should falter in the future, in our will to use it, millions now living will surely die. Now there's a time for making plans, and there's a time for action. The time for action is here now. And indeed, they did act, and they did create the, uh, the institutions. And just to, just to elaborate uh, what he said later on in that speech, he said, the essence of our problem here is to provide sensible machinery for the settlement of disputes among nations. Without this, peace cannot exist. We can no longer permit any nation or group of nations to attempt to settle their arguments with bombs and bayonets. So he was four square behind the creation as the US was, unlike after World War I, the creation of the United Nations. But Time moves on, and four years later, we were looking at a very different uh, reality. For us, war is not inevitable. We do not believe that there are blind tides of history which sweep men one way or another. In our own time, we've seen brave men overcome obstacles that seemed insurmountable and forces that seemed overwhelming. Men with courage and vision can still determine their own destiny. They can choose slavery or freedom, war or peace. I have no doubt which they will choose. The treaty we are signing here today is evidence of the path they will follow. If there is anything certain today, if there is anything inevitable in the future, it is the will of the people of the world for freedom and for peace. So uh, there was the creation of NATO, an alliance uh, to face down the, what was seen as the Soviet threat. The previous month, just after the text of the proposed treaty had been released to the public, public Secretary of State Dean Acheson went on radio, and I tried to, the, I, I was going to play his radio speech for you, but the sound was too bad. But the, the, here you can see him saying that the best deterrent to aggression is the certainty that immediate and effective countermeasures will be taken against those who violate the peace. And then probably the most quoted line, uh, 
he ever uttered is that, was that if the free nations do not stand together, they will fall one by one. So here the U.S. had moved from backing a, an international institution for solving conflicts to forming an alliance. And just what was this alliance? The most famous part of the NATO Charter is Article 5, which says that the parties agree that an armed attack on one of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an, an attack against all of them, Elected and security consequently, here. that if such an armed attack occurs, each of them, in the exercise of, of the right of individual or se collective self-defense recognized by Article 51 of the UN Charter, will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking forth with individually and in concert with other parties such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. And any such armed attack and all measures taken as a result thereof shall immediately be reported to the Security Council and, this is an important kicker, such measures shall be terminated when the Security Council has taken the measures necessary to restore and maintain international peace and security. So here is an alliance created that says an attack on one is an attack on all. We are entitled to uh, protect any member of that alliance as though we had been attacked. We will report it to the Security Council but we will not cease and desist until uh, the Security Council um, has taken the measures necessary, essentially, to eliminate the threat. So not only had the U.S. created this new alliance, but had clearly said that the U.N., this, a, a realist might say this is exactly what you should expect, uh, a realist would say that the U.N. Uh, is subordinate to the interests of NATO. Now it tells you how hard-boiled a realist Kennan was that he was also against NATO for two reasons. One is that he thought it would unnecessarily militarize the standoff with the Soviets. They would create a, a similar alliance, which they, did. which they indeed did um, a few years later. That's where the Warsaw Pact came from, was the, Russia, the Soviet response mm -hmm. to NATO. But he also said, it's stupid, because when the chips are down, countries follow their own interests. They're no, law, they're no more going to be guided by membership of an alliance than they are going to be guided by UN resolutions. Nonetheless, the US created NATO. And it, the, the first thing to say about NATO is it, it's a historically unprecedented, highly unusual alliance. If you think about George Washington's farewell address to Congress in 1796, he said, and this was seen as a warning for the future, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign world. If you Google up, um, if you Google up things like international encumbrances, you can find American president after American presidents saying we will not commit ourselves to any encumbrance uh, on a long-term or permanent basis. Um, and uh, they all echo this philosophy that was once attributed to Lord Palmerston from a famous speech he made in the House of Commons in 1846 when he said, we have no eternal allies, we have no perpetual enemies, our interests, another hard-boiled realist, are eternal and perpetual, and those interests it is our duty to follow. So American presidents had been guided, uh, American administrations had never formed any kind of permanent alliance that essentially followed the Palmerston-Washington view. And here we have uh, the creation of an alliance among the Western powers um, dedicated to uh, protecting one another in perpetuity with armed force if necessary and subordinating international institutions to that purpose. Now, 
A lot of debate about whether NATO was successful during the Cold War. Uh, you could say, well, the U.S. won the Cold War, and some people say, uh, you could say that uh, we wouldn't have won it without NATO. That's one of the, we can't run the counterfactual, uh, so it really is something of an imponderable, uh, whether you, the, we could have won the Cold War without NATO. It is also worth I'm noticing that, word. that NATO during the Cold War never actually went into battle. The first time NATO, a NATO operation occurred, which I'm going to talk more about later in the course, was in Kosovo in 1999, after the Cold War over. And by the way, when Article 5... Oh, of course, I need a pause in order to address this question. What he describing is just idealist positions stemming from the lack of a need of such alliances prior to America's rise. Huh. Hey, gotcha! Uh, from lack of a need for such alliances prior to America's rise to a superpower. Um, man. But definitely back then they were an idealist. Indeed, back then they were for the interest of the state. Staying clear from alliances allowed us to steer clear away from World War I initially. There was... There's an argument to be made that isolation at the time, yes, we can call that idealist now, but back then it did make sense. During the time it did make sense. Thank you. Now, of course... With the aftermath of World War II, the shambles of the UK no longer being able to hold the grip of, uh, as the world's superpower in the world, the fall of the British Empire and all those things, the decline of British hegemony, there became this power vacuum with the United States and the Soviet Union creating the, what was the, well, I'm going to say duopoly, but as uh, the bipolar world. That was the Cold War. And so at then it sort of became necessary because of the fear, the rise of the Soviet Union, the spread of communism. We wanted instead to spread capitalism, liberalism, the free world, democracy. And so at that point, then yes, it became ideal to be isolationist we had to have joined blah 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 but what he is saying is that if we're going to be looking at history this is a sudden shift of how the united states does approach foreign policy it is unprecedented It makes sense knowing that it was circumstantial. It didn't make sense because it was circumstantial. <laughs> um, do, I, do I think there's a degree of isolationism to rebuild economies? The nationalist trend always seems to follow a monetary crisis. Do I agree there is a degree of isolation to rebuild economies? No. Why would there be? No. That, that is, if we're rebuilding foreign economies, that's not isolationism. That's my point. The sentiments are idealist. The actual isolationist policy was a practical matter, and overturning it was also a practical matter. Uh, therefore, there's nothing particularly odd that American foreign policy involvement would contradict those presidential quotes he showed us above. Man, you're being... That, that's the thing, though, is that... Now, change. The change of interest... That is something that is sudden. Yeah, like you can say, for I, I think for us, because we have the benefit of the hindsight, we have the benefit of studying history, we can say that it makes sense. And we could be really rational about it. But imagine living during that time, and then all of a sudden there was a switch. Different story, right? Because you're living in it. I think it's really important when studying history, we have to look at it both ways. 
one with the benefit of hindsight and two with the respect of that time and during that time yes it was kind of surprising i do understand that I don't know, i'm giving a lot of credit to this guy i'm also giving a lot of credit to you i give a lot of credit to anybody just I, I want to like make sure that we're all we're all able to synthesize like what he is saying and what you are saying are not necessarily contradicting there's different ways of analyzing something these frameworks do not clash and it's kind of healthy i think personally it's kind of healthy to switch your modes of thinking from one to another and you're in that way i think you're able to look at something very specific but in a broad sense it's like I don't think trade isolation is good for economies. It's not. It's not. But, like, uh, I think the question was, do we think there's a degree of isolationism to rebuild economies? That's The answer is no, uh, to my opinion. Just a curiosity, I have seen the trends from the studies I have done looking at some of the patterns. It seems to almost be a human approach. What are these patterns? I did not think of it as an argument about what is looked like at the time. I did not think of it as an argument about what it looked like at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, even to, um, you know, like people during the lecture, to, to us as the audience, this is something that we have to think about also because, yeah, to us, like, it just makes sense. And then we sort of realize, wait a second. You're right. It is kind of weird that we just made that switch. Huh, I didn't think about that way. Boom. Boom. Different way of thinking, right? It's kind of amazing. I love it. When I ask more out of personal curiosity, I'd like to get the perspective from younger folks and the shift in how political opinions change. Ah, huh. well, yes, I am younger folk. Okay, moving on, moving on. Good, good, good. Let's go, let's go. What were we talking about? We're, this is still talking about NATO. I still talk about NATO, and we ended off with the change from isolationism to more, uh, more involved in foreign policy. But even so, the United States was closely creeping up away from its isolationism. So, like how we got involved in World War One, how we got involved in World War Two, a lot of it we we did deal with trade. We did uh, do the Lend Lease Act. We did get attacked, and this is kind of like our subtle way to, to get in for the executive to get into foreign policy matters when and bypassing what was the very isolationist Congress. I can show you in study on public opinion for uh, going into World War II, and in that in the very beginning of World War II, the public opinion for um for getting involved was very low but when the president started to make a lot more uh speeches about getting involved and things like that just like as a cushioning the fall public opinion started to increase in line with what the president sentiment was and then when the attack happened and then it was kind of just like inevitable boom it shot up and then there was a there was majority approval and then we got involved in world war ii not because of public opinion but just if we're going to be talking about public opinion that's that's the trend it's very interesting uh there's globalization then there's imperialism uh what okay that was kind of out of nowhere there is globalization then there's imperialism um we can say that globalization is is imperialism people can argue that how we define isolationism here is quite interesting as well since it's hard to it's hard to call u.s actions as a regional power in the americas prior to its period as actually it's hard to call u.s actions as a regional power in the americas prior to this period as isolationist correct let's think about uh theodore roosevelt so let's think about uh the monroe doctrine and things like that yeah now I'm sure that when it comes to the the main point about alliances and the main point coming from Washington's farewell address was to not get involved with 
powers that are stronger than you and not to get into something that you would kind of regret so let's take for example the security dilemma between the two alliances in europe that started world war one when one person got shot and then everybody else started pointing fingers at each other pointing guns at each other the united states was not a part of either of those alliances therefore it did not get involved boom alliances can without perfect information and without proper communication can as well as very bad circumstances can muddy the waters and get you into some shit that you really don't want to get involved in but because you're in an alliance you're obligated to because you're in an alliance you're obligated to the circumstances for south america on the other hand well you know it was like our territory so no problems there right <laughs> So yeah, it's it's also pretty hard to call the United States isolationism during that time too. It was like it was like a, a it was a norm and we broke it covertly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Public opinion really did change though. I was not triggered because uh, no NATO country was threatened. And that same thing is true with subsequent NATO actions in the post-Cold War period, such as the invasion of Libya in 2012, about which we'll also be spending time later. The partial exception was 9-11, uh, although even then NATO, uh, the US essentially went to war more or less immediately after the attacks, and uh, NATO allies uh, participated, but NATO didn't assume full operational control in Afghanistan until several years later. So NATO after the Cold War. Some people, such as French President Francois Mitterrand, said, well, it's done its job. We should get rid of it. Um, it was there to protect these countries against the Soviet Union, and what, what it's now an alliance without a purpose. Um, that was a, a difficult thing to do right at the end of the Cold War because of East Germany. Um, and the, the thing about East Germany was it, it rapidly became clear after the wall came down that Germany was going to be reunited. And uh, it was just uh, it was an unstoppable force to reunite Germany. And reuniting Germany made a lot of people nervous. Uh, there were pe many people remembered World War II, and, so, and some, uh, not that few, also remembered World War I. And the idea of an independent Germany outside of NATO made a lot of Europeans nervous. And so the real the impetus to, in, to say the reunified Germany would be part of NATO um, came from the other European powers. And um, the Russians didn't like it. Uh, they, they, too, said, you know, what's going on here? Why is NATO starting to expand? And George Herbert Walker Bush and Helmut Kohl, who was then the German chancellor, promised Gorbachev uh, that NATO would not expand beyond including Germany, and that had been an artifact of the reunification. Gorbachev. Uh, was less than impressed by their reasoning. And I am not persuaded by the assurances that we hear that Russia has nothing to worry about. You cannot, you may not humiliate a nation, a people, and think that uh, it'll have no consequences. So my question is, is this a new strategy? I feel that if the same kind of games continue to be played, if uh, one country plays some card against the other country, then all of those problems, all of those issues that we've been mentioning today will be very difficult to resolve. Last night, free elections, political pluralism, the problems of concern to you. So he was skeptical. Uh, he thought that this is not 
uh, this is not likely to be how things are going to play out, but he, did, he saw this, as he says in that clip, he saw this as a humiliation of Russia. That, or it was still the Soviet Union at that time. He saw this as, as, a, as a humiliation uh, of the Soviet Union and uh, was, was adamantly uh, opposed to it. But history played out differently. So let me just give you a sense of what was coming now. There's a pattern to genius. There's a method behind the magic. Yeah. I always tell people my inspiration. Yeah, yeah. The method is to follow Senpai Chow and to come onto all of his streams and watch him and ask questions and we'll learn together and we'll all become geniuses because Senpai really, really appreciates you. Anyways, skip ad. Today we welcome Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, finally erasing the boundary line the Cold War artificially imposed on the continent of Europe, strengthening an alliance that now clearly is better preserved to keep the peace and preserve our security into the 21st century. For the 16 of us already in NATO, enlarging our alliance, our goal is to help to build a Europe that is undivided, free, democratic, at peace, and secure. So there you have it, uh, the first three East European countries uh, included in NATO in uh, 1999. And that, as you can see, is the, the first edition uh, uh, of countries besides, uh, as Germany's not on this list, uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, so this didn't go down very well in Russia. As Gorbachev had predicted, it produced a sense of outrage and humiliation. Um, so here, again, just to give you some, a couple of, uh, a little flavor of it. Is that a dollar bill? Okay, that's illegal. It's against the law, you can't do that. What are they saying? Are they saying death to America? Is there CC? Yeah, there is. No translation? Speaking in foreign language. So a couple of comments about that clip. So uh, one is, uh, uh, um, on the signs, one of the things that they're, they're demonstrating about is that President Clinton had um, bombed uh, Iraq for violating the, the um, no-fly zones, and they're saying basically only an idiot uh, or worse would be bombing Iraq, uh, the no-fly zones that had been set up following uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion from Kuwait. Um, this gentleman uh, at the end of the clip is somebody by the name of Sergei Baburin, uh, he was a, he was a Rus Soviet Russian politician uh, and subsequently became one of the leaders of a far-right populist movement. And what he's saying at the end of that clip is uh, he's basically saying, we made, we made a mistake once, but the, the next generation are not going to be making the same mistakes. And it's interesting that uh, he said this in response to them demonstrating against the uh, American bombing of Iraq. Uh, 
partly because, as I noticed in 1991 <coughs> when I was in Moscow, and I was told you about uh, in an earlier lecture, the US Desert Storm operation was hugely popular among Russians in 1991. In 1991, the US could do no wrong. In fact, in, in Moscow, in 1999, uh, 1991, in March of 1991, there were actually com What? <laughs> I'm suspended? What do you mean? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I got someone who unfollowed me. <laughs> no, I'm good. Fucked in that. Commercials um, s for selling um, Desert Storm condoms. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I never quite could understand what, what I was trying to communicate, but uh, th there had been, there had been no, no resistance to the idea that, that Bush Sr. had gone in. But, you know, uh, seven years later, when uh, these East European countries were starting to join in, uh, to join uh, NATO, um, things played out very differently. And it didn't stop there. It continued. We are gathered here Jesus today. Jesus Christ. To celebrate the death of your website. See you. I also do not approve of this. Thank you all. Welcome. Thank you all. Thank you all. Good afternoon and welcome to the White House. Today we proudly welcome Bulgaria, Estonia, Soviet state, Soviet state, Latvia, Soviet state, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia. <laughs> These are all Soviet states. We welcome them into the ranks of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. When NATO was founded, the people of these seven nations were captives to an empire. They endured bitter tyranny. They struggled for independence. They earned their freedom through courage and perseverance. And today they stand with us as full and equal partners in this great alliance. This is a special moment in the hopeful story of human liberty. As America formally declares its support for Albania and Croatia's entry into NATO. We strengthen America's partnership with nations that once found themselves in the shackles of communism. We rejoice in taking a major step toward welcoming the people of Albania and Croatia into the greatest alliance for freedom the world has ever known. And I want to reaffirm as strongly as I can the United States' commitment to honor Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. No ally or adversary should ever question our determination on this point. It is the bedrock of the alliance and an obligation that time will not erode. The NATO membership process, which requires applicants to make reforms across their political, economic, and defense sectors, has helped create the stable democratic Europe we see today. We were glad to see the alliance welcome Albania and Croatia last year, and there can be no question that NATO will continue to keep its door open to new members. Montenegro's uh, accession is good for Montenegro, it's good for NATO, it's good for the stability of the Western Balkans, and it's good for international peace and security. Today is a historic day, 
So, President uh, Vujanovic, uh, welcome so much to NATO. It's a great honor to have you here. Welcome. With NATO membership, our future will be stable, secure, and prosperous, and we will make decisions about the most important issues within the strongest, the most organized, and most efficient alliance in the history of mankind. Okay, so I want to clear up something about because we're just watching the lectures. We're not reading any of the assigned articles. We're not reading any of the actual, perhaps, the geopolitical analysis that would come from better from text rather than from presentation. So, yeah, when it comes to these lectures, a lot of what is going to be shown on screen is going to be something like speeches from leaders, etc., blah, blah, blah. This is to keep the audience engaged, to be honest. These are fucking boring. Like, these are... The people in the audience, they're being forced to go here, okay? <laughs> they're not like us, who, or unlike me, who's actually watching this to get a refresher on uh, IR politics and whatnot, and history, whatnot. Uh, but they're doing this for credit. And so it, it's, it's very important to have a combination of both uh, the lecture as well as some visual... Some visual, not entertainment, but some visual. I'm not sure I follow probably being dense. Okay, yeah. So, you see, when you're talking about imperialism and uh, what's it, globalization, okay, when you're talking about imperialism and globalization, yeah, like, if it's for you, if, it e if it's easy for you to distinguish between the two by intention, one is military, one is economic, then like, sure, that's fine too. I mean, for me, I've studied globalization and and imperialism. I don't know. I study more globalization and less about imperialism. But I know about both in that it goes a lot more deeper than just the intention. So then that's me. Like, for me, I don't want to compare. I don't want to use one in order to juxtapose I don't want to use both of them to juxtapose against each other in order to explain them. I think both terms ought to be explained by themselves for what they truly are, for all the factors, looking at it also holistically throughout history, what hasn't been done, done before in the past, what has changed, do we have to change the name, or do we have to change the definition, things like that, okay? Like, definitions, they change based on time. Duh. This is obvious. What I'm saying is that, like... For other people, they may not necessarily understand you nor agree with you, which is basically what I'm doing. I'm disagreeing with you, and I'm just, like, trying to explain how I see it rather than, like, trying to, I don't know, say that you're wrong because you're not. It's just how you see things. Other people may see it as the same thing. Other people may agree with you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Other people may see where you're coming from and then disagree with you and see us as, as completely something else and that's because they believe it's there's a different priority uh, in like certain factors so maybe for them it's not intention for you it seems to be intention or for you it seems to be the means okay whether it's done economically and whether it's done militarily that's a means thing that's not an intention thing that's a means thing by the way so like for you the difference really comes down to the means Whereas for other people, it may be the effects. It may be the ends. And to a lot of people, maybe the ends are the same thing. Who knows? Boom. And things like that. There are different forms of it. It could take different shapes. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's really all I have to say about uh, globalization and imperialism. I would rather you talk about both of them as if they were separate and not use one in order to juxtapose against the other, and vice versa. Perhaps tend to piece their definitions of these words from a bunch of contradictory uses, even in academia. Yeah, yeah, I know that too. Hey, if you catch me doing that, call me out, because uh, I, I don't like doing that. Uh, but hey, you know, people have their slip-ups. I don't mind being disagree with you. It's how we learn. It's why I'm here. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. I love that you're here. Yeah, I love that you're here. So you a Shalmar. 
Yeah, you. I know you. You've been really engaged. Both of you have been really engaged. Yeah, thanks. Really good stuff. So, uh, as you can see, this has been a bipartisan story on the U.S. side. Democrats and Republicans alike have led the expansion of NATO to include uh, all of the former uh, members the of the Warsaw Pact, except I notice and appreciate you. Russia. And this actually doesn't tell the whole story because there were uh, others who wanted to join NATO as well. Um, so in 2008, for example, NATO announced that it would welcome the addition of Georgia and Ukraine to NATO. Uh, and that is part of what prompted the, the Russian uh, incursion into Georgia in 2008 and also had a big impact in Ukrainian politics that uh, contributed to the way things uh -huh. would play out. Uh, in gotcha. 2014. I get them. A uh, couple of other things to notice about this accession. You might wonder why in 2004 uh, we added all of these countries uh, to NATO. Why do you think, anyone have a thought, why would the Bush administration, many, many East European countries wanted to join NATO from very early on, but there had been resistance. I mean, after all, you know, you're committing yourself to go to war if one of these countries is attacked. That's not a light, that's not a light thing, right? You actually, it's not, it's not like saying, well, let them join the European Union. If they don't like it, we'll kick them out or they can leave. Th this is really committing you to defend these countries. Why would the US, anyone, pardon? It was, re it was related to what he was doing in the Middle East, but it was not deflection. What had we, what were we doing, in, what had we just done in the Middle East in 2004? Yeah. We had just invaded Iraq, and then the British took over uh, the Iraqi Spring, but I was not fully Bingo, exactly right. So what had happened was, um, after, uh, and this is something we will return to later in the course, but once the Bush Jr., George W. Bush, had decided to invade Iraq in 2003, he, uh, unlike what his father had done, he couldn't get a uh, Security Council uh, resolution to authorize it, and um, he had a lot of tri trouble putting together a coalition because all the, the Middle Eastern countries were not in favor of it, and he, was, he, he needed the fig leaf of an international coalition to um, create, he thought, legitimacy uh, uh, for this action. And so if you look at all of these countries except Slovenia, uh, every one of these countries joined the coalition, nominally at least, and sent troops to Iraq uh, when the U as part of the, the uh, U U.S. Um, led uh, coalition of the willing. They, they joined the coalition of the willing and the quid for the quo was that he supported their uh, accession to NATO the following year. Interestingly though, they all got rid of the draft uh, in the meantime. Uh, clearly they were worried about the domestic politics of committing their youth to fighting in wars uh, for, uh, to defend NATO countries. So here you see that uh, geopolitics playing itself out uh, in this way, that uh, this is very much an interest-based story, that Bush is looking to uh, get legitimation uh, for his invasion, and so that became the impetus for getting these countries to join. Um, it, it's also, you might, one might think it's, it's something uh, of a, an, a, an anomaly given the Trump administration's hostility to uh, NATO in general, why they, they allowed the Montenegro thing to go forward. Of course, it'd been, it, it had been started much earlier, but I think uh, as far as Trump is concerned, it doesn't really matter who's in NATO. Um, Nonetheless, his, the question that Trump asks about NATO is not a crazy question. 
right? And it was it's the same question Francois Mitterrand was asking. What is this alliance there actually for? Um, so, so there's some enduring questions about post-Cold War NATO, which are going to come back uh, later in the course. One is, was Mitterrand right? Uh, was, uh, was there a missed opportunity at the end of the Cold War? Was Gorbachev right? Did NATO expansion make it more likely that someone like Putin would come to power in Russia? Um, Gorbachev had said, humiliate people and there will be consequences. Um, and certainly the, the, uh, the, the, the steady incursion uh, of, of NATO into the former, uh, not only Eastern Europe, but as I said, they were running up trial balloons uh, about incorporating uh, the Ukraine and Georgia in 2008. Uh, there's a colorable case that this might have uh, bolstered uh, the nationalism of a figure like um, Putin. We'll come back to that too. And what are the advantages and costs of having a permanent military alliance that now lacks any clear motivating purpose? It's, read, it's led by the most powerful military on earth. Um, it's not clear what its goal is or is not. Uh, we will see later in the course that when it has become active, it has had nothing to do with Article 5 of the NATO treaty. Bro. It's rather uh, taken on new missions and uh, new rationales, mostly ad hoc, dreamed up on the fly to suit the interests of different players at different times. So when people say, we don't need NATO anymore, the Cold War is over, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you repurpose the organization. It's still very robust. It's very organized. Building something like that takes a lot of time. And it's an opportunity. It's a foundation that we don't want to let go of because of all the opportunities that we could use it for in order to achieve our interests, blah, 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 blah. It still has its purposes. doesn't need to go away. Let's turn to the Washington consensus, or what I'll, I'll say, taking neoliberalism global. And I'll talk somewhat briefly about this because I want to spend most of the rest of the time talking about the European Union. So the Washington consensus, again, um, and the, what, I'm, I, what I call the Washington consensus is essentially a global version of what often gets called neoliberalism. And I think of it, uh, again, distilling it down and getting rid of all the jargon uh, that plagues these discussions as having three main features. One is deregulation. Uh, the second is free trade or trade agreements. And the third is privatization of state assets, previously held state-held assets. Um, within countries, that tends to be called neoliberalism. Uh, when the World Bank or the IMF uh, or the Americans try to get other countries, as they did particularly up until the financial crisis, when the Washington consensus, we'll see, started to lose some of its um, ideological power in the world, um, that's what they, that would, the, the core elements of the diet on which they would insist uh, for countries to get US aid uh, or, or aid from uh, institutions controlled by the World Bank or the IMF. And it's difficult to overstate the um, confidence, the hubris, we might say in retrospect, the confidence within, with which this was viewed as the, as the one size fits all approach to economic development. In 2004, in uh, a speech to the, to the New York Fed, I think it was to the New York Fed, um, Ben Bernanke, who was then chairman of the Federal Reserve, made a, a speech that you can, if you Google up his great moderation so-called speech, it's a speech in which he says, essentially, the technocrats running the Fed are now sufficiently competent that um, we, we've, well, he didn't actually say this, but this is how it's what it's come to be stood 
sometimes can be interpreted as having said. What he actually said was somewhat more nuanced. But he, the, the takeaway lines from the speech are to the effect that the Fed has basically managed to, if not abolish the business cycle, manage it uh, so successfully that the peaks and troughs uh, cannot be too damaging and we can largely have no inflation, full employment, and let, let the technocrats run it. Uh, as I said, what he actually said, if you go and read the whole speech, was a little more nuanced than that. But it, it became emblematic of the idea that uh, this diet of uh, economic uh, deregulation, free trade, and privatization uh, informing all pu uh, public policy uh, was the way to go, and that the world would be hunky-dory uh, thereafter. Uh, deregulation of Wall Street uh, after the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999. So here, um, the Glass-Steagall Act had been enacted in the 1930s in the wake of the Depression to stop um, trading, uh, to, to stop investment banks from engaging in uh, investments on their own accounts with depositors' money. You either have to be an investment bank or a commercial bank. The banks didn't like it. They, they, they lobbied against it for decades. And actually, by the time it was uh, repealed in 1999, there wasn't much of it left. Uh, read Ron Chernow's The House of Morgan, if you want the blow by blow uh, of, of, the, of the lobbying about that. Uh, brilliant book, uh, among his many brilliant books. Um, and so there's great debate now uh, about how much actually getting rid of Glass-Steagall co contributed to the financial crisis. Some say not at all, some say it was, it was really all about uh, real estate markets had nothing to do with that, and some say a lot. But my, my point in mentioning it here is not whether repealing Glass-Steagall contributed to the financial crisis. I tend to think probably not. But uh, it, it was emblematic of and ushered in a whole other set of steps of deregulation. So for instance, in 2004, Hank Paulson, who was then chairman of Goldman Sachs, <laughs> led a group of the five biggest banks to Washington uh, to lobby Christopher Cox, uh, who was then the head of the SEC, not the sharpest knife in Congress, um, <laughs> to <laughs> lobby him on the grounds that uh, if, um, if, if a bank was sufficiently big, if it had $5 billion in assets, it should be exempted from capital requirements or have reduced capital requirements because um, they were big enough to self-insure. The thought that because they were... That we were too big to fail, and it turns out that they were big enough to fail. <laughs> I'm going to have to go. I have to do something at an 8, so we're cutting the, short, the stream short. Uh, more so, not because of time. We would have been able to uh, closely finish towards the three hour point but i have to do something at eight and there was a lot of chat engagement today thank you very much to shalmar dem as well as i gotta scroll up hamblis for that dsc for twitch doubles on in while i'm just leaving i'm gonna have to give you a follow so i really have to go i'm sorry guys but I'm not. DSC for Twitch streaming. It is not. Slap a follow. Guys, slap a follow to DFC for Twitch. This is an organization that I have just recently joined. I will uh, announce more as things start to get closer and more developed. <laughs> Thanks for the follow. DFC for Twitch. I notice and appreciate you i have no idea who is in charge or who is behind the screen for dfc for twitch uh, but I will, I will soon be able to get to know everybody once i start uh communicating see you later i will see you later too yeah thanks for watching mm -hmm. yes yes that is indeed the channel that cat just did an interview on just let the vid run on its own no i need 
Guys, everybody, everybody, continue to watch. Continue to watch. Here, I've put the link in chat. I'm going to be finishing this out later, and we'll catch up on Lecture 4 on Saturday. I'm... Where is this... Where is this noise coming from? And welcome to the show. This is... Oh, my God. Um... It's the offline. That's that's what's that's what's happening. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Peace out. Senpai notices you. Have a good day. Have a good night. Boom.